right, so where to begin? You guys have given out so much information before this panel already. We've seen guest casts. We've seen great leather outfits <laughs> um, with like only one other person could pull off. Um, so I'm congratulating you. Do you guys find yourselves when you for the producers when you started with season two? Did you find yourselves kind of um, altering any storylines, or was this whole season designed from the beginning? Season two? Yeah. I, I, truthfully, in the beginning of season two, we were sort of terrified. I was actually the hardest thing I've ever had to write because, uh, I, you know, we had so much great success in season one. We were just all terrified that we were going to like be one of those shows that was like, oh yeah, they had a great first year and then you know fizzled out. So there was a lot of we had a lot of pressure on ourselves. Just but you know, so many of the things we did were again things that we had discussed from the pilot. I mean, you know. When we made the pilot, two of our biggest ideas was that Sarah wasn't dead and that at the end of season two, Oliver would wake up in Hong Kong. And, you know, those were two things that we, we <laughs> managed to get to in, in season two that were things that we just discussed casually amongst Greg, Mark, and myself. So it was really exciting to have had enough success to be able to get to that stuff. What about getting John back? Was that like just a wish list thing? <laughs> It's funny because, you know, as you can see, I'm a big Doctor Who fan, and <laughs> I knew John would understand because it's kind of happened with, with Captain Jack that, like, he was on and we said, so you have to go away for a little bit so you can come back again even better. And John's like, yeah, I, I understand that. I've done that once before. I'm happy to do it again, thank God. And, uh, you know, we were always planning leading up to John being a regular in, uh, in season three. Okay. Um, um, okay, so, and Mark, you showed me something backstage um, that you guys already had season three mapped out. Yeah, actually, we have a huge set of cork boards. Here, I'll show it to you. Yeah, that's it. So this is going to be all the spoilers you're going to get this season. So yeah, basically, it's the whole season. I'll, uh, as soon as my phone goes, I'll show you. Yeah, yeah, basically, that's it. See there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, I saw a shower scene on one of those cards, right? What shower scene? I, I have no comment on that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Did you say shower scene? Yes. <laughs> There are a few. Me. <laughs> you guys need a second? <laughs> Do you guys need a second? <laughs> All right, so you have, you have season three mapped out. You, you, you killed us with that finale, but you also ended on a happy ending. You, Team Arrow, was in a good place. Um, I, I'm guessing from that trailer that that does not stay that way for long. No, and we thought that uh, with... Uh, you know, after ending season one on such a, a, a dour note with Tommy dying and, and the city in flames, that the, what, what could we do that would surprise people in season two? We thought the thing we could do that would really shock people was to give them a happy ending. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but so much of season three is about, you know, what price victory. And, you know, at the beginning of the season, everyone is sort of enjoying uh, the peace that they, that they have found. And, and as Mark always says, everything's coming up arrow. And, you know, as, as Joss Whedon has always said, you know, the minute you give one of your characters happiness, you have to yank it away from them. So, uh, and you realize that there are now like 47,000 tumblers that have, Oliver Queen gets a happy ending. <laughs> um, so, and clearly, <laughs> I'm trying to help that. It wasn't caused by Malcolm Merlin either. <laughs> yeah, it took a while, it took a while. So, one of the big things everyone wants to talk about is this first date. <laughs> so, we'll get to that in a second. <laughs> I want to know, Stephen, um, season, season three is Ollie, you know, completely embracing his hero side. And in a way, you have been the hero of this show. You have stepped forward with social media and reaching out to the fans and really just being, like, so accessible. Um, I feel like, in the same way that Ali has not failed his city, you have not failed this show. Oh, um, thank you. Do, you. do you feel as responsible for this show as, as Ali feels for Sterling City? Oh yeah, for sure. It's, it's, it, if, if anything, 
you know, there were points in the first couple of seasons where maybe it was a little bit more important to me than it should have been. And, you know, it, but look, I'm, I waited my entire life for uh, an opportunity like this and to see the way that the fans have reacted. I remember sitting in this hall, or in this, where are we? Are we in a hall or a ballroom? All right. Thank you. <laughs> I remember sitting in this ballroom and making a promise to the people that were here that we were going to work really hard and that the show wasn't going to suck. And that, I mean, that sounds... It's, it sounds simple, but that's, that's what drives us every day. <laughs> Um, well, I have to say, I mean, you know, it's very clear that a lot of the marketing, a lot of the stuff is, yeah, you've got an okay body. Um, you realize those are my... It's, you know, we're seeing better. Uh, community cast. No, um, but I have to say, this was probably some of your strongest dramatic work ever. Uh, the stuff you did this season, especially with Moira in, the, in her press conference and following her death was, I mean, this was, like, next level, Stephen. Thank you. Did you... Were you, like, working with these guys to say, like, let's take this guy to a deeper level? No, I, 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 don't, I don't write the show. I let, I let those guys write the show. But I, um, I mean, for me, we talk season by season, but I always think of it like we are shooting our 48th episode right now. And we're always trying to make 48 better than 47 and 47 better than 46. And there were a couple of scenes in season two that press conference scene, there was a, I thought, a, a wonderful scene in the hallway between, between Laurel and I, and all the dramatic stuff surrounding Moira's death. Um, I crave those opportunities, and I was really grateful. So when they present themselves, I try to be ready. Mm, nice. And Colton, also Colton Haynes, always have to build in time for the screens. So Colton and Willa, you guys had some amazing stuff, especially at the end of the season this, this year, um, really touching right before, you know, you went to the dark side, Willa. Um, these guys, I really... Like, <laughs> so did you guys, were you guys like just chomping in the mid to get these two together and like had these great emotional scenes? I mean, we kind of hit it off from the beginning, right? Our first day, my first day on the show, I got to work with Will, and we had this really, really fun... It was one of our first scenes was actually our kiss scene, which yeah. was pretty hilarious. <laughs> it was yeah. one of my favorite things that we got to shoot together in, uh, in Europe. Well, well, hey, guys, I mean, come on, how can it not be? Look at Colton. Well, they actually told us to do mouth-to-mouth. -mouth. Oh, yeah, this is one of my favorite stories yeah. as well, actually. Um, one of our, story, but... our, our first uh, kiss scene, is our director asked us to uh, do more kissy, kissy, that's the way he ordered it, man, and so Colin and I were just like, oh, okay, and he's like, wait, no, can you just do, like, more mouth to, like, mouth more to mouths, mouth, better mouths, yeah. and so I grabbed his nose and just breathed straight into it, yeah, I thought that that was kind of, like, what he asked for, he asked for mouth to mouth, so. She has amazing breath, so. I do. Nice. Yeah. It's great. It brought me, it brought me to life. Um, and so Willa, is daughter like father? Have we found out yet? I mean, I was just having this conversation. Um, Thea is going through something pretty crazy right now. And uh, all I can say is that I have been hitting the gym a little bit. <laughs> and uh, so I think that's like really the only thing I'm allowed to be hinting towards because, I mean, these gowns are just so amazing. Have you yeah. <laughs> and how, how has it been taking her from like drug me prep school dropout to super villain love child? <laughs> uh, she's definitely made a big change, I'll say that. There's, there's no more vertigo dancing around on tabletops for Thea. I think she's going to be a, not necessarily a good put-together girl, but um, a different girl. Definitely a different girl. The Thea that you guys saw in season one and season two is not the girl that's coming back in season three. Nice. Um, did you keep the pants from the finale? Did you keep those leggings from the finale? Of course I did. And that trench coat? Are you kidding me? Right. It was amazing. <laughs> um, all right, so David, uh, fatherhood. Come yeah. to the dig. Come to dig town. Daddy Diggle. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Hashtag Daddy Diggle. Yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> how, is, uh, how is fatherhood going to change not just the man, but also his place on Team Arrow? It looks like somebody doesn't want him on the front lines anymore. It's a very, very good question. A lot of uh, dramatic tension. Because, um, yeah, he's, he's a child and the stakes get higher. Does he stay with the team? Does he leave? <laughs> By the way, this, the scene that you guys saw in the preview where David is yelling at me and whipping his massive arms, it was almost impossible not to flinch. <laughs> yeah. Which, yeah, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, no, it's just, it's just a great, I mean, it was just a great story point to make Diggle a father. I think the stakes have gotten a lot higher. All right, um, so Elicity is a situation <laughs> that we're going to talk to in a little bit later. Um, so, John, you are back. Yay! Uh, first, I need to ask your co stars what is the raunchiest thing he has done on set so far? If you say anything, I'll kill you all. <laughs> So it must have been good. Um, what have you? What do you know about with what Mr. Merlin is up to now? Well, I, I was actually just saying to Andrew as we were talking, and he said, you know, have you read the scripts? And I literally just flew in uh, yesterday from London, and I finished. Which I must say, uh, the producers have been really, really wonderful in allowing me to do finish the stuff up that I've had to do in the UK, plus a couple of things I have to go that were pre-contractual. Um, so thank you very much. Um, but I have yet to read what I'm about to do. So I'm sitting here not knowing like you're knowing. And all, these guys are saying, have you just seen this? Have you seen this? And I'm like, no, shut up. <laughs> I don't want to know because tonight I'm going to be in my hotel room going, no way! Are you kidding? <laughs> can't wait. I really can't wait. That's part of the excitement about... Uh, episodic television for me is almost not knowing what you're going to do until that script comes out because then it's your, you know, that's the thrill of doing it is trying to figure out how you do it but also how you make it really believable for, for you guys and also it just makes it much more fun because it, it's more spontaneous that way. Alright. Um, Paul? Hello, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was just enjoying it. I'm assuming he survived, uh, whatever the chest pains, was it just gas? <laughs> it was, it was a, uh, yeah, it was a, uh, a dodgy takeaway that night. Um, um, yeah, that was definitely a, an issue, those chest pains, well, they brought me down, didn't they? But I appear to be on this panel, so, I don't know, what do you think? <laughs> and we, we have a talk afterwards. The only problem with that is all my hair fell out, as a result of this hard situation. But. Well, now you're covering it with, it looks like a captain's hat? It does look like a captain's hat. This man has had the craziest police career. I know, it's been up for years. <laughs> um, that shot was very heroic in that clip. I Can you myself. tell us anything about what he's doing? Sorry? Can you tell us anything about what he's doing? Well, he's standing there with a cane and a lovely hat. <laughs> By the way, Paul, you, you can stop with your British accent now. Yeah. <laughs> can I go back to how I normally talk now? <laughs> uh, no, I'm carrying on with the British accent. Um, Paul, uh, he's... Quinn's come to become like the Commissioner Gordon of Starling City. Um, well, you said it, don't you? Any chance of us seeing him, this is with producers, working with the CSIs of Central City? With the what? The CSI team of Central City. Well, that is an interesting question. I'd like to direct that to our producers on the right hand side. <laughs> That'd be a nice place to go to, right? <laughs> um, well, we previously announced that uh, episode uh, 108 of The Flash and 208, uh, 308 of Arrow are going to be a two-hour crossover event. Which I guess you guys think is a good idea. I don't think they want this. I don't think they want this to happen. No. Um, so we'll be seeing people from both shows crossing over. So it's uh, everyone will get a little taste of each other. That sounded so bad. <laughs> I'm a bench on Barrowman, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it goes and run as fast as he can. <laughs> yeah, but that, that's one of the fun things, and Greg always talks about, you know, that, you know, when we were kids, the, you know, the Six Million Dollar Man by Bionic Woman, when those shows would cross over, or, you know, when you see, uh, um, you, you know, uh, Oscar. Oscar Golden, uh, you know, go back and forth. It just, 
it reminded you that there was sort of reality to it, and that you know, and these spin-offs they're not existing in different worlds, and things that happen in you know in Starling City affect Central City, and vice versa, and that's it's really exciting to us. That's awesome. It is exciting. Yeah. That's, that's totally cool. awesome. Um, do you guys have anybody for the actors in the panel? Do you have anybody who's going to be on the Flash that you want to work with? I, I want to work with Jesse Martin. I like Jesse Martin. Yeah. I want to work with everybody. Not, not Robbie Amell? Oh, yeah, and Robbie Amell. I want to work with Robbie Amell. <laughs> I can't believe I'm saying Robbie Amell. <laughs> I want to do a sandwich scene with the both of them, so uh, <laughs> I'll string both of you up. That, how's that? Yeah. So I have to ask about this because we know, I think, in episode three, Felicity's gonna do a visit. Uh, episode uh, 104 of The Flash, uh, Felicity is going to uh, show up in Central City, having. Uh, okay. So I need to ask. So this is where we get into some of the juicy stuff. So. Oliver has Laurel, Sarah, now Felicity, um, Isabel at one point, probably Amanda when they're in Hong Kong. And Diggle. And Diggle. <laughs> um, Felicity has Barry and Oliver. And these people are very busy. How are you keeping all of these couples straight? And Stephen, who do you think Oliver actually... No way. No? <laughs> Come on. No. Okay. <laughs> all right. <laughs> um, let's talk about the guest stars you guys have lined up. Is Starling City big enough for all the people you're bringing in? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, one of the things we talked about a lot is, you know, season three, you know, is, is typically when shows bring on, you know, some game-changing cast members. You know, Greg, when he, when he was doing Everwood, brought on Scott Wolf, and, you, you know, uh, you know, if you're fans of Buffy, you know, that third season when they brought Faith on, you know, Liza Dushka. Um, you know, it really, you know, it's, it's one of those things that once you get season three, when you see the cast, like, you sort of can't imagine what those first two seasons were like without them. So, you know, we were very conscious of making uh, those additions this year, and we, you know, when we, uh, we actually first sat down with DC, we asked if we could, uh, uh, bring Ted Cord on, and, and uh, they had other plans for him. And then they said, uh, well, how about Ray Palmer? And we're like, that's better. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, and when we originally pitched it, we sort of said that, you know, we've, you know we want to bring on somebody who's a lighter hero, you know, uh, somebody who's a little bit more fun and, you know, a little bit Superman. And so we got Superman. <laughs> Are you guys going to have any fun? Is anyone going to point out that he kind of looks like Superman? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, and he's also got his eye on Felicity. Oh. You gotta do the love triangle. You, you gotta do it. It's like she's the only two flavor in town. <laughs> <laughs> um, she is the best. Um, so now let's talk about Felicity. This has been long in the making. This is a thing. Let's talk about it. What can you tell us about this situation? Okay. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something about their date. This is a really, a really big spoiler. They go for Italian. Mm. <laughs> sure. <laughs> like Italian. They eat dinner. <laughs> um, uh, seriously, they, that's it's part of part of oh, Gert Gagrin. We've said this before, but they. Um, you know, we weren't trying to fake anybody out with the, their confessions, or Oliver's confession to her at the end of the year last year. <laughs> no, no, we really weren't. Uh, and so we'll deal with that directly this year. Uh, their feelings for each other, which, which I always believe have been genuine. And Stephen, what is it like now? The dynamic has to shift a little bit, right? Uh, this year they just go out on a date. Yeah. And then we'll see what happens when I can't say anything, okay? <laughs> All right, then let's just say, how does the date go? Oh, horribly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, also, a dynamic that's been changing is the Oliver Roy situation. They are now full on sidekick. Um, how, is it, how has it been being like the Jedi Master to 
Mr. Chief Bones here. I get <laughs> How's it been, Steven? Yeah, I gotta tell you, it's really cool having the second nicest suit on the show now. <laughs> the suit's pretty badass, though. It is. Isn't it, you guys? <laughs> no, it's, uh... It's... The, the, the dynamic between Oliver and Roy uh, brings out parts of the Oliver Queen character and a lot of the... Um, a, a lot of the, you know, the, 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 the smarter, more sarcastic, more humorous elements of the classic Oliver Queen character that we are building towards. And I think that the Oliver Roy dynamic allows me to play a lot of those things. But there, there are unresolved uh, issues for Roy leading back to last season. So again, however good they are right now, I'm sure they'll get bad really fast. <laughs> I'm imagining the, the Merlin Thea situation is going to be a problem for the two of them. I, well, I think that, you know, again, not knowing what's going to happen and, uh, you know, being excited about that, I think there's, the element also is that mm, there's going to be a, a lot of controlling and uh, I think that uh, Malcolm is going to want to see how much he can gain control or, you know, he's always been able to control people with finance, with doing uh, damage to them by hurting them with the violence, but he's never been able to control emotions in a sense, and that's really, you know, with Tommy, um, when he, you know, fell in love and, and became the hero, uh, you know, when he died, he had no control over that, so he, you know, he lost his son. So yeah, I think he's going to go for the emotional side to control Thea and see how that works. That's what I think. That's not what I've read yet, but I don't know, but that's what, that's kind of the thing that I'm thinking. And then, who knows? That, what will happen between these two and maybe these two, uh, how, how it plays out. But I'm, I'm looking, you know, for me, as John, as, as the fan, as the, the you know, the, the guy that has the, the DC encyclopedia lying next to his bedside table, um, seriously, <laughs> I am, I'm really looking forward to the, the conflict and also a bit of fun, you know, because Malcolm isn't the, He's a bad guy, but he's also a smart guy, and he's got a sense of humor. And it's great, also, that Ollie's that side has come up with the, with them, um, you know, with Colton and, and all that kind of stuff happening. So, so I kind of want to see them become like the Boris and Natasha of Starling City, <laughs> where they're like always like plotting, like in their trench coats. <laughs> yeah.